Ramana, who is the executive vice president and head of branded business at DRL or Dr. Reddy's. Uh, Mr. Ramana, thank you very much uh, for joining us on VQ Prime. Uh, to begin with, sir, uh, give us a sense of how the US business has been this quarter. So as you would see from the results, uh, we have got a good quarter, uh, thanks to the new product uh, launches. Uh, as you know that we had a volume limited settlement uh, and uh, that's what you see in terms of the performance uh, in the US uh, for the current quarter. Sir, uh, can you take us to this volume limited settlement? How does it work uh, for you? Is it a, a gradual increase in volumes over a period of till the time the, uh, the drug was off patent or, or is this constant volume every year uh, which you have to deliver? I won't be able to give you as many details, but uh, we do have a volume limited settlement uh, till the time we go into 2026. So, is it my uh, question is that you know, is it are we going to see an incremental revenue every year from this kind of agreement? I would uh, probably put it this way that uh, we would have uh, the performance going into the next couple of quarters as well. Okay. okay. So, sir, is it going to be at similar levels or uh, is there going to be a fluctuation? Because I think we've, we've done a lot of good business this quarter. And is it only because of uh, the RevLimit launch or is it also because of the other products that we have launched? So, we have had uh, s uh, several uh, products that we've launched along with uh, Leonardo Med uh, as well. And not only if you take at a company level, it has not just been a lendomite launch alone. Uh, we've also seen the Russia sales coming back. If you will remember, uh, because of the stocking in Q4 of last year, the sales in Q1 this year was muted. But if you see sequentially, we have grown 85% compared to Q1 of last year. So Russia has also come back and contributed to the overall performance. So, sir, I want to understand a little bit more on the U.S. business. Uh, in the last quarter, when we had the conversation, we spoke about there still being price erosion that we are facing. So, has there been any easing out on that side as well? Or is it just because of the new launches? So, in terms of the pricing erosion, I think it continues to be normal as to what it was. Uh, so, that's something that we are able to do. In spite of that, I think the new product launches that we have done, uh, has also contributed meaningfully for the quarter. Okay. Um, so, so going forward, how do you look at the US business? Because that I believe this time was 48% higher. Is it going to, is the growth going to be at similar levels or will we see some normalization and India growth might come back? Because I think India growth was relatively muted as against the past conversations that we've had. Sure. So if you take in the US, the way I think uh, we had all uh, you know spoken uh, earlier as well, so there is a uh, growth that we're expecting in the US, which is going to be in terms of single digits. And we do have a set of, I would say, products that matter that would come from time to time. And that is when you would see a good uh, trajectory in terms of the growth. But otherwise, uh, US is a focus market for us, and uh, we have several products that are lined up in terms of launches. Coming to India, uh, if I remove the COVID sales, we, are, we have a double-digit uh, growth. So COVID sales uh, has been muted, uh, not only for us, but for the market. But in terms of the levers of growth for India, which has been productivity, which has been uh, big brands, which has been business development, both in terms of licensing and acquisition, licensing in of Novartis as well as Sidmus has gone very well. So we continue to focus over there and India continues also to be the focus market for us for Horizon 2. In terms of how we look into end-to-end -end disease management and the identified uh, therapeutic areas and the identified diseases and how could we deliver better outcomes to the patients. So where are we now planning to make investments? Uh, what are the segments that we're looking at? So if you take from a point of India, there are certain therapeutic uh, areas in which we do have a uh, preeminent position. We are either with the top five or top 10. So those are the areas where we want to understand uh, the patient journey, understand what is the unmet needs and where could we find the white spaces to make a difference for the patients. So this is where we will continue to do. For example, as you know, we are developing CAR-T uh, for uh, uh, lymphoma for BCMA. Uh, 
Uh, we are developing a nutrition products, whether it is in the area of oncology, whether it is in the area of hepatology, nephrology, uh, diabetes. Uh, so we are making investments. Uh, some of them are adjacent to our existing business, but pretty much uh, we are looking at how to make a difference to the patient in those identified diseases. So there is also some investment towards biosimilars and injectables. Uh, could you just elaborate on how this is going to function? Sure. So as far as biosimilars is concerned, the good part about that is uh, we now are developing the product with a single trial, a trial that would help us to take us into multiple markets. Um, and this obviously uh, would would get us because if you take our current footprint, uh, we have our own uh, field forces and our own offices and operations in about 35 emerging markets along with India, then several markets in Europe um, and with the US, which has always been a traditional uh, stronghold. We do have a good representation and there is increasing, uh, um, I would say, support uh, for the biosimilars by various uh, drug authorities. And uh, we feel that this is a good investment that we are making. And obviously, uh, beyond Rituximab, every product that we want to bring into the respective market, we want to be among the first few to launch in that market. So, so when can we expect the launches then? So if you see today, uh, we do have a rituximab clinical trial that is completing and we do expect that uh, quarter one of uh, FI24 that we would start to file in the dossier and then as and when we get the approval, rituximab would be the first biosimilar launch um, in the US and European markets while we've launched rituximab in many of the emerging markets. Having said that, while we're getting the next set of global portfolio, we do have bevacizumab, we have uh, trastuzumab, uh, we have darbopoietin, uh, we have pegfilgrastem, and these products were today taking into a large number of uh, emerging markets. We've got approval uh, for um, bevacizumab uh, in uh, Russia, we have got approval in several other markets. So we will have a set of products that we are able to get them into the emerging market. So the next two to three years, while the global products are expected to be ramped up from 2025. Um, Mr. Ravana, uh, you spoke about that uh, sales of the Russia, sales from Russia way back in this quarter. Uh, have they reached the same uh, scale and level uh, pre-Russia Ukraine war, or is it still uh, some level, uh, still some way to go to reach that level? And we have got back to where we were. And how has it uh, been the trade? Uh, are we facing uh, issues with respect to trade and uh, receivables from Russia or is it uh, a smooth process which you see? It's a smooth process. Um, of course, we were in the initial stages finding the various routes to try and ensure availability of the products, whether it was Russia or whether it was Ukraine. We have been able to establish several routes to ensure availability of the products, uh, but we don't uh, see any difficulty in terms of uh, uh, the, the trade. Uh, we saw margins uh, improving in this quarter. Do you see, uh, as you go into Q3 and Q4, uh, there's further room for the margin uh, growth coming in? So if you see uh, the way in which I would put the margins of um, this quarter, it is also because of the new product launches and also taking into effect some of the price erosions in the generic uh, market. So as I said, I do expect that uh, some of the new product launches to continue to support us uh, in the next uh, couple of quarters. But at a company level, uh, we had shared with the investors uh, of being consistent uh, with an expectation of 25% ROC and 25% EBITDA. So we, we continue to work on that um, across all of the markets. So, so it is uh, safe to assume that 30% will not be sustainable. Is there any reason why we can't live up to the 30% levels? So I think uh, what uh, we had also committed is that we would need to continue to make the investments. So we need to, whether it is investments uh, into R&T or the investments into Horizon in order to ensure that we have sustainable uh, growths across the markets. So uh, our guidance has been that while we will continue and there are several, we are a diversified business, we have several growth levers and while continue to grow uh, in all of uh, the identified spaces, 
this is about the consistency. You could have, um, you know, uh, where we would get benefit of certain growth levers working uh, better for us. But what I'm looking at is a much more long-term perspective. That is the if the focus uh, for us as an organization. Now I'd like to understand on the investments that going into injectables. Uh, are we doing it for third parties or uh, is it also for internal consumption? And how is it going to play out in the future? Sure. So injectables, um, I would say, is the common denominator across most of the countries, whether it is India, US, uh, Europe, as well as emerging markets. So we have been able to leverage this and it is becoming a meaningful contributor to each of the geographies. So started off with uh, onco injectables, then we have antifungals, anti-infectives. So what we are constantly doing is now that we have a good market share across most of the markets, what is the next set of portfolio that is relevant relevant to the patient and where should we be doing the investment? But the investment is pretty much in sync with the quality of the portfolio. Sir, so do we have some number of how much contribution do we have from injectables already? So at, at this point of time, injectables contribute, if you take uh, some of our leading businesses, anywhere between 12 to 15 percent of sales. Okay. Mr. Ramana, you know, it's been a, uh, a pleasure talking to you today uh, at the, uh, on the eve of the second quarter earnings. Uh, we hope to see you next quarter as well. Thank you very much for joining us on Wikipedia. Thank you. Thank you, sir.